Hi everyone, in this video we'll be discussing the predicting of metal reactions and discussing metal reactivity. We'll be looking at the reactivity of metals with water, dilute acid, oxygen, and with other metal ions in solution. The relative reactivity of different metals can be predicted by understanding the periodic table trends, and what's provided is the Nessa periodic table which has been color coded from red to blue. And what we can see is that there is an increase in reactivity from the right hand side to the left hand side of the table. We should recognize that there is actually a similar trend from the top to the bottom of the table. If we remember, this is actually the same periodic table trend as the first ionization energy, or the potential. If we remember, the first ionization energy is the energy that's required to move the first valence electron from a particular element. Remember that we can predict the first ionization energy trend using the octet rule. If you're unfamiliar with this, please watch the video on periodicity. Metals which have a low first ionization energy are going to be more reactive. And we know that group 1 metals are going to be the most reactive because they have the lowest first ionization energy. And examples of such group 1 metals are like Na sodium as well as K potassium. So looking again at our periodic table, this time it is not color coded, remind ourselves that the bottom left of the table is going to have the most reactive metals, while the top right is going to be the least reactive. This also comes down to the fact that on the top right we actually have non-metal elements. Transition metals are generally going to be less reactive than group 1 and group 2 metals. And the reason for this is because they have a greater nuclear attraction between the electrons and the nucleus. If we look at this Bohr model diagram for nickel, what we can see is that there are a large amount of electrons which are in the inner shells of the atoms. And then we have two valence electrons on the outside, which is characteristic of many different types of transition metals. When metals react with water, they generally form either a metal hydroxide or oxide, as well as hydrogen gas. Some factors which need to be taken into account include the reactivity of the metal, as well as the temperature of the water. Water, which is of a higher temperature, is going to provide more energy in order to ionize metals, allowing for reaction to occur. Remember earlier that we said that lower group elements are going to be more reactive. This means that the temperature of water for reaction is going to help us to predict metal reactivity. A water bath is the apparatus which is used to regulate temperatures in order for us to better predict the reactivity of metals. An example of a water bath is shown on the image to the right. The metals potassium, sodium and calcium will all react with cold water in order to release hydrogen gas. We are able to see an example of the reaction between sodium and water on the right hand side, as well as in the equations down below. The reaction between sodium and water leads to the formation of sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas. It is important to note that the sodium metal becomes ionized in order for reaction to occur, and this ionization process can be seen in the bottom equation with the complete ionic equation, where the initially neutral sodium metal becomes ionized into sodium plus. Because these metals, potassium, sodium and calcium are so reactive, the amount of energy which they release when becoming ionized is so great that actually it ignites the hydrogen gas which is produced by the reaction as we can see on the image to the right. Aluminium, zinc and iron will react with steam until red hot in order to form oxide ions and release hydrogen gas. The reason they require steam to react is because they are transition metals and they have high first ionization energies which we previously indicated. This is the same as the idea of the comparison between magnesium and calcium where magnesium requires hot water to react in order to overcome its higher first ionization energy. Also, these metals form oxide ions instead of hydroxide ions, and this is important to note. The reason why this occurs instead of the formation of a hydroxide is because the oxide layer which they produce is much more stable, whereas for a reactive metal, they will first form an oxide. However, those oxides will act as intermediates in a further reaction where they turn into hydroxides. Our example of iron reacting with steam until red hot will form iron oxide. The iron in our complete ionic equation starts neutral and turns into Fe2+, as it has been ionized. Lead, tin, copper, mercury, gold and silver are all examples of metals which do not react with water. They are called inert metals, also known as noble metals because they are unreactive. 
The reason why they don't react is because they have the highest ionization potential, meaning that they are the most difficult metals to ionize. Our first example asks us to write an equation for the reaction between sodium metal and water. Sodium will react with cold water to form hydroxide because it is a highly reactive group 1 metal. Let's write out our equation. Remember that we need to balance our equation. And now we are done. The next question asks us to write the equation for reaction between zinc and water. If we remember, zinc is a transition metal. And because it is a transition metal, it is going to be more stable. More stability means that the formation of oxide is not going to lead to the formation of a hydroxide. So we can write out our equation. Metals will react with dilute acids in order to form salt and hydrogen gas. Remember that a salt is a word that we use to describe ionic lattice substances, and in this case they will be ionized in the water. Dilute acids similarly will react with metal to ionize them, and so the more rigorous the reaction between a metal and a dilute acid, the more reactive we should expect those metals to be. The reaction between potassium, sodium, and calcium, reactive metals, and acids, we should expect to be highly reactive and highly exothermic, meaning that release large amounts of heat. Similar to previous reactions between metals and water, they also release a large amount of energy. In fact, they release so much energy that they ignite the evolved hydrogen gas. And the hydrogen gas is indicated by effervescence, which is bubbling. Sodium, when reacted with dilute hydrochloric acid, is going to produce salt sodium chloride in aqueous state as well as hydrogen gas. If we look at the complete ionic equation, again, the sodium, which was originally neutral, has now become ionized and becomes sodium plus. Magnesium, when reacted with hydrochloric acid, is also going to form a salt, as well as hydrogen gas. However, the reaction does not lead to the ignition of the gases because it does not release as much energy. Here again, we can see that the magnesium has been ionized and turns into magnesium two plus. Aluminium, zinc, iron, and tin will all react with dilute acid to produce a salt and hydrogen gas. Bubbling slowly will indicate the formation of the hydrogen gas. However, because they are transition metals, they are also going to be less reactive. And that means that they will bubble more slowly. We are able to compare the reaction rates qualitatively by observing the bubbling of the gases produced by the reaction in the reaction vessel where we are conducting the experiment. Again, our transition metal aluminium, when reacted with hydrochloric acid, is going to form the aluminium ion. Inert metals like lead, copper, mercury, gold, and silver will not react with dilute acid. However, they will still react with concentrated acid as they are stronger oxidants, meaning that they have a greater ability to ionize those metals. Oxidation is discussed in the video on redox reactions. Our example asks us to write the equation for the reaction between iron metal and dilute hydrochloric acid. If we remember, iron metal reacts with hydrochloric acid as a transition metal to form a salt and hydrogen gas, albeit it will be slower because it is less reactive. Metals will react with oxygen to form a metal oxide. To make the reaction occur faster, the metals are usually combusted, meaning that they are reacted with oxygen in hot temperatures. Potassium, sodium, and calcium will burn very rapidly to form an oxide or a peroxide. The oxide layer which is formed is going to be highly reactive and will combust spontaneously in air. An example of a metal sodium oxide is in the above diagram, and it forms even without heating. This oxide layer may combust on its own or exposed to air under heat like it does in the image below. The image on top does not show a spontaneous combustion, likely because the sodium has been covered in a layer of oil. The dipping of the metal in oil prevents a reaction between the oxide and the atmospheric oxygen. Metals such as magnesium, aluminium, zinc, and iron will burn to form oxide. However, these oxide layers are less reactive, just as they were when they reacted with water and when they reacted with dilute acid, but they may react further by burning or dissolving in water. The inert metals such as lead, tin, copper, and mercury will become coated with oxide layers during the heating process. However, because the oxide layers which they produce are highly stable,
they will prevent further oxidation of the rest of the metal because it will prevent the penetration of oxygen into the deeper layers of the metal. Gold and silver are particularly inert metals which do not react at all with oxygen. Our first sample question asks us to write an equation for the reaction between silver and oxygen. We should remember that silver does not react with oxygen, so we write that Ag plus O2 leads to no reaction, N dot R. The reaction between potassium and oxygen is going to form an oxide layer. Metals when dipped in a solution of a less reactive metal will lead to the deposition of those less reactive metals in solution. An example is the dipping of copper metal into a solution containing silver ions. Because silver is less reactive than copper, when copper is dipped into the solution containing the silver ions, silver particles will begin to deposit out of the solution to produce solid silver and the copper will dissolve into the solution to become ionized. This is a practical which is performed in school to help create a reactivity series for the metals. If you look at the results, iron, lead, zinc, magnesium, which are all more reactive metals than copper, are going to have a displacement reaction when they are dipped into the solution of copper sulfate. Silver, which is less reactive than all the other metals, is going to have no reaction indicated by N dot R. This means that when I dip iron into copper sulfate, the copper will deposit and the iron will dissolve. And the same occurs for iron and lead. But it does not occur between iron and zinc because zinc is a more reactive metal than iron. This means that we can use these results to work out our reactivity series. Since copper only reacts with one metal, it is going to be the least reactive, followed by lead, iron, zinc, and magnesium. The least reactive of all of them is going to be silver, which does not react with anything at all. When conducting this experiment at school, make sure that you sand the metals to remove any potential oxide layers which may have which may have formed to prevent reaction between the metal and oxygen gas.